Well, how's everybody doing today? Good? All right. Well, we're going to dive right in this morning, but uh, first of all, I want to uh, mention just a couple things. I know they've been mentioned a couple times, but uh, one of them is next Sunday, we are doing a baby but slash child dedication service. And so what that means is um, there, there are different traditions within the church, right? And uh, some of you, in fact, many of you may be familiar with uh, infant baptism, and that's something that uh, many churches even still do today, and this church has done in the past. Um, but we are going to have, if this is not infant baptism, this is called a baby or child, it could be a child, dedication. I mean, the last one I did in California, we probably had, uh, uh, I'm going to say there was like 65 people across the front and like 30 some odd babies and children because they were all new believers, had never been in church, uh, mostly most of them all of their lives. And so it comes from the principle of uh, Samuel, when his mother could not have a child and she begged God for a child and said, if you will give me a child, I will give him back to you. And that's exactly what she did. She, she kept him and raised him until he was weaned and then uh, got him big enough until she ter- literally handed him over to the priest to be raised in the, the ministry and the service of God. Now, I'm not asking you to do that. I, I, you don't send your kids home with me, okay? <laughs> but the principle is there of giving our children, dedicating them to God, and we make a covenant with each other that we as parents and members of this church are going to give ourselves to making sure that we raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord so that they will know Him and know how to live for Him all the days of their life. Amen? And so if you would like to participate that with us in that, I don't care if you have a baby or if you have a 12-year-old, um, if it's you want to do something like that, talk with uh, Ms. Marla and uh, we will get you slated to uh, do that next Sunday, okay? Now, I think there's something else I was supposed to expound on, but maybe I'll remember it by the end of the service, okay? Well, this morning, though, um, I want us to pray before I preach. I don't know about you, but I just feel this sense of uh, bleh. Oh, wow, head's nodding. You feel it too. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know what's going on in the world today, but I do know this, that God is still God and He's King over all, amen? And I do believe that we don't just do what we do just to get past it and go on to the next day, that today is just as important as any other day. And whatever that meh is, we're going to get rid of it right now. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray, oh, I just felt the anointing of God come into the room. In the name of Jesus, we serve notice to every demon in hell that would come against any person, any family, even this church, even in the world today that's operating, that doesn't want this word to be spoken or doesn't want us to thrive in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We serve you notice right now by the blood of Jesus Christ and the authority that he has given us. You have no place in this place. You have no place in our hearts. You have no place in our minds. And we rid ourselves of you right now in the name of Jesus Christ and the authority that he gave us. Right now, today, we declare is your day, God. And we love you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. I don't know about you, but I felt something shift just right there. And I do believe that this word today um, is, uh, it's really a right now powerful word for today. Now, it's interesting and I love it how God does this because it's just the next one in the series, right? So, it's not like I planned for anything in particular other than I've been studying and I've been, been doing my thing, right? And so it's not like I planned a special day, 
But today, just as the next step in the series, this is a powerful word that I think that if we'll grasp a hold of it, it will give us something that we can chew on, not just this week, not just today, not just, but really for a lifetime. So I encourage you to write down the notes. You, if you don't have the notes, didn't pick up the notes, go get them in the, in the foyer. Um, whatever you need, raise your hand. Maybe one of the guys will bring it to you if you need some. But, but I encourage you to take notes because this is going to be a powerful word today. Um, not because I am speaking it, not because I'm doing it, but because God speaks life to us through His Word. Amen? So we've been talking about the, uh, the Beatitudes, and we have uh, w- talked about being blessed. And the, really, just to reiterate, the state of being blessed, this is deeper than just a surface, I'm doing okay and I'm happy. I- I'm just blessed, Right? It is deeper than that. It is a state of being where you know that God is in His rightful place in your life and that the blessing runs deep in your heart and you are in a state of contentment with God in spite of your circumstances. Now, some, I, I, I just got to be honest with you that... Uh, this has been an, as much or maybe even more for me than it has been for anybody else because this powerful process, we've talked about the, the power of the nines. We've got the nine Beatitudes, and we're on number seven today. There's nine fruit of the Spirit. There's nine gifts of the Spirit. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should go on to uh, um, fruit and gifts you, you know, after this. I don't know. I, how, there's a reason why... Just so you know how I operate, I've got a, a, a preaching calendar for the year, and I like to plan ahead, and I, and, I, and I put things on it, and then if God speaks to me, I might go in and change it and edit it, but I, I've got certain series and different things planned, and, and I just happen to have a hole right in the middle of the year. I'm like, God hasn't spoken to me about the, 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 the middle part of the year yet. You know, I've got other things. I've got Christmas working on Christmas already, working on Church of the Movies, working on different things, and and because, uh, I, I, I mean, it takes a lot of work. I, I can't keep up if I don't plan ahead, right? But there's this hole in the middle, and so I, I'm just expecting God's going to speak to us something powerful that will um, really do something deep in our lives. But this series right here is important because if we will grasp this, we living as Christians means that we should be living different than the rest of the world. Amen. It also means that we should be living different than what uh, an old, 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 old friend of mine and my wife's, in fact, um, she used this term, churchtons. People who attend church and profess Jesus but don't really live Christianity out. Churchtons. So we should be living different than being just a churchton. And sometimes I get in the way of myself. Sometimes you get in the way of yourself. And these nine different beatitudes really are different nails to the coffin of self. They are nails to the coffin of self. In fact, if you, this is not in my notes, but an often quoted scripture that I, I, I quote is Galatians 2 and 22. You might want to write that down in your Bible, circle it, highlight it, whatever. It's a cornerstone verse for living and how we should live. It's, I am crucified with Christ. Now, let's talk about this. Obviously, we weren't there on Calvary. We weren't there on Golgotha. We weren't crucified on that same day. We weren't even alive that same day. But, but here's the thing. Paul's talking about to the church at Galatia, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but it is Christ who lives through me. What he's saying there in essence is I have to put myself, my flesh my fleshly desires, my, my emotions, my sinful ways 
I have to put them to literally to death every single day. Every single day. Because you know what? If I'm not careful, I might be doing good today and tomorrow and the next day, but, but there will be a circumstance that comes my way that will tempt me to awaken that sinful nature and respond a different way than what Christ wants me to respond. Amen? Now, hopefully, the longer I live for Him, the more practice I have, the more I live for Him, the more I employ the principles of the Word of God, the easier it gets to just put it to death. But I got to tell you that it will never, ever completely be gone until we are in eternity. And so God wants us to literally, and and it's so antithetical to the way the rest of the world works. If you go and listen to what the world is saying right now and what culture is saying right now, it's all about me. And it's not any different than it has been in the last several thousand years, right? It's just um, new faces, same old things, right? There is nothing new under the sun. We're shocked at the news. We're shocked at everything that's going on. It's not new. It's been happening for thousands of years. It's resurging now, you know, things that have happened over the centuries and over the millenniums. It's resurging now, and that's a whole other topic. But, but, but God says we have authority over our flesh. He says we have authority over sin. We have authority. And, and it's not true that we can't be tempted or can't go through things that are too much for us. You might be going through something today that is more than you can bear. Maybe you have in the past, or maybe you're okay right now, and maybe someday in the future you will go through something that you literally cannot bear. You see, we're not promised that we will not go through things that we can't bear. He says you won't be tempted beyond what you can handle. He's always made a way of escape, so therefore there is no excuse for sin, right? But the load and the tragedies of life can become more than we can bear in and of our own selves. But here's the cool thing. God has said, I don't know who needs this because this is not anywhere in my notes today, but but I feel like somebody must need this because this is like pouring out. God says, it might be bigger than you, it might be heavier than you, you literally might, if you did not have Jesus, you might take your life, you might lose your mind, you might lose everything, but I got to tell you, with Jesus, all things are possible and you can handle it because he will handle it for you, he will handle it with you, and your, your circumstance may or may not change immediately, but I got to tell you this, there's strength in the name of Jesus, there's authority in the power of God, and you are not by your self. Amen. So we're talking about blessed. We've talked about poor in spirit. We've talked about blessed those are, are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Meekness is not weakness, but what? Power and perfect control. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. And now we come to verse 9. Blessed are the peace makers. You'll notice that there is a difference between the term peacemakers and peacekeepers. And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. I want to go back to last Sunday. Um, we, we'd been hearing of, a, I'm sure most of you have heard of it by now, but the, the new movie that's out, The Sound of Freedom, is making quite the waves. And um, so... Uh, Brianna and Hootie were going to go see the movie last night. We just kind of invited ourselves <laughs> and showed up uh, and, uh, um, and uh, watched the movie. And I got to tell you, it was the most uncomfortable uh, movie I have ever watched in my life in a powerful way. Everyone should watch it. It was the most grievous, the most, uh, like, I have never been more moved and more emotional at a movie ever in my life. I mean, I think I hit it well. I just sat there silently, but uh, inside there were so many things going on. And I began to think about that 
about the sermon today, if you don't know what it's about, it's about this guy who, uh, working for Homeland Security, he, he was involved in sting operations for child predators and uh, sex crimes, and he ends up quitting his job to go rescue children out of it, and he's still doing it today. He has a big organization that, that they, they rescue children out of sex slavery all over the world. And uh, very, very powerful. And I began to think about blessed are the peacemakers. And because sometimes we get the idea that peacemakers are just, well, just be nice, avoid conflict, and let's make everybody happy, peacekeeping, and that will make life better. Now, I'm going to say this right up front. There are times where peacemaking is keeping our mouth shut, right? There are times when it's just wisdom just to keep your mouth shut and just let people be, to love people, to do what we do and just do it as unto Jesus. But there are times when peace, being a peacemaker means going into conflicts and fighting the battle. Do you hear what I'm saying? So this man, he went into battle. He risked his own life. He risked leaving his wife and children. And in fact, in, in several of the interviews that I've heard this week, you know, uh, he was talking about when this was all coming to a head and he told his wife, you know, I've, this is what is expected of me and it's very dangerous. And he was, he, on the phone was telling his wife every detail and making it as real as could be, knowing that and hoping that she would say, well, you're not going to leave us and our kids. You get your tail back home, right? But in that moment, they were having some God encounters and God doing some things in their hearts. And from on the phone, she said, you need to go save those children. We're going to be okay. Because being a peacemaker sometimes means going to the front lines and fighting the enemy. Now, we might not be putting ourselves in physical harm's way to do what he does. But spiritually speaking, I got to tell you that there's a war being raged on our minds and on our emotions and on our children and on our families and on society as a whole. And society wants us as Christians, much of the culture wants us to be quiet and just let them be and to be a peacekeeper by holding our peace. But God wants us, I feel like, individually and corporately, to not be milk toast people and to have a backbone. No, we still do all things in love, but to know that there is a war being waged and it's okay to step into that war and keep making peace for our families and making peace for our homes and making peace. And we're going to talk about how to do that today. I'm not just talking philosophically this morning. We're going to talk about some practical things. But but I do know this, that blessed, Jesus promises, blessed are the peacemakers. Now let's look at this word here real quick because there's some insights that we can get from this. The, the word peace here is probably, I don't know about you, but to me it's the most famous uh, Hebrew word I know, and it's the word shalom. I'm sure you've heard it. It's a greeting in Israel. It's a greeting amongst Jewish people. Shalom, peace. And it's not just like saying hello. Literally, the word shalom means I wish you to be whole. It's, it's a word meaning wholeness, completeness, fulfillment, and, and get this, inner rest. It literally means to be living without deficiency or lack. Shalom, peace. 
I have need of nothing. I am in lack of nothing. I have lack of nothing because I am at peace. But there's the other part of that word peacemaker, shalom. We are to be shalom makers or shalom. What that word literally means is to be doers of peace. Peacemakers, peace doers, makers or doers of peace. So many times, I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I feel incomplete, not whole. I don't have that completeness, that inner uh, strength that this describes. And literally, this is a command for me to go make peace in my heart. Sometimes, it's like we're just waiting for peace to come in the sense of, okay, sometimes we define peace as lack of conflict in our lives. Well, God, bring me peace. And that'd be great. I mean, and God can do that. We're going to talk about how he does that in just a moment. But, but literally, he's telling us to go and make peace, to build peace by how we live and what we do. Be peacemakers, peace doers living without deficiency or lack. You see, the world, Jeremiah describes the world like this, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. In fact, this reminds me of where we're headed because did you know that that's the whole thing that the Antichrist is going to tout that will bring him to power? Where... We should not be surprised at where the world is headed because the world has to get to such a place where there is no peace and there is no rest and people are desperate, so desperate for peace that this man of war will rise to the forefront and promise peace. And you know what? He will give it to the world for a short time. For a short time, it'll be like he's got all the answers and everything will be okay and everybody's going to be happy, but it will be short-lived because the Bible talks about how it is a false promise. He brings peace to the world for a short time in order to grab hold of the world, but then he will be a man of war and a man who will crush the people. And so you see the power that comes from peace because everybody wants peace, right? Right? I mean, every woman that has tried to become Miss America or Miss Universe, what do they say they want? I want world peace, right? Sorry. But they cry, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. We are never more like God than when we take the wholeness and the completeness or the shalom of God we have into a world that so desperately needs it. It, we're walking into a very uncomfortable place in faith. And it's going to become harder and harder for you and I to feel like we are peacemakers in the world that we live. Because our idea of being a peacemaker is different than the world's idea of being a peacemaker, right? Our idea is... We will bring the King of kings and the Lord of lords into everything we do, and it will bring peace, and it brings life, but even with that brings confrontation, right? Jesus, by virtue of just who He is, is confrontational, right? And in fact, Jesus Himself said, I, I did not come to bring peace, now in this sense of the world, to the world, but a sword. And what He's saying here is like... 
I didn't come to just make you feel good in your sin. I came to bring a sword to do surgery on hearts. And it does cut and it does feel like a confrontation. When the power of the cross confronts us with our sin, we do not have peace with our sin anymore. The peace that he has surpasses that and it's better than that. But until we get to his peace, there is conflict. Amen? And... and I read an article this week, and I usually don't read these articles because this particular uh, newspaper I just despise, and it's the, the Washington Post, and, uh, but for some reason, I, I clicked on the article because it just, there, you have these triggers, you know, and you just know you need to read it, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but this time it worked because it, it really just confirmed to me what was happening, and so the story goes like this, so there, there was this... Um, couple, but it was a gay couple, two men who owned a restaurant in this small little town, a northeast state somewhere, I can't remember where, it, it's irrelevant, but the whole point of the article was, it was us versus them, and that a conservative Christian couple across the street was attacking them, and uh, because of who they were, right? Right? Now, first of all, the things that it was documenting in the story, if that other couple were really doing those, I don't know the truth, right? It was neither conservative nor Christian. But you see the picture that they're painting, that if you don't agree with us, then you are the enemy, right? But I got to tell you this, that this is how God wants us to be peacemakers, he doesn't want us to condone sin, but he does want us to love people. Had I been their neighbor, you know what I would have done? I would have gone over and I would have eaten at their restaurant and made friends with them. And I would have loved them and I would have tipped them well and I would have recommended people to their restaurant and I would have, would have, would have. There's a whole long list of things that you can do. And then when they find out that you're a Christian, they're taken aback and they're like, oh! do you hear what I'm saying? Because they're shocked that you actually loved them. You actually Bless them. You actually entered their world without being critical. But yet when they ask and when God opens the door out of love and respect, you make peace by going into the flaming building. It reminds me of another story. A guy named Jack, he was a firefighter and he was off duty not getting paid, and he's driving by, and somebody's house was on fire. And you know, they have those little stickers on the windows where the, the kids' bedrooms, the identify as the kids' bedrooms, and Jack pulls over, and he rushes into this house. It's burning down. It's too hot. He doesn't have his equipment, doesn't have his oxygen, and he runs in, and he pulls out this baby out of the crib, and he runs out of the house, and he saves the baby, he saves the mother, everybody's going to be okay, but he was willing to go in when nobody else would go in. There was a whole crowd gathered around watching the house burn down, watching the flames, watching, the, and a gasp, oh, look at it burn down. And yet one person was willing to go in at their own peril, at their own risk and save them. That's what we do when we make peace. He was making peace for that family. He was making wholeness for that family. He was making, do you hear what I'm saying? Making is doing. And so when there are people who are living lifestyles that their lives are in flames and their lives are burning down even if they don't know it yet. I got to tell you that it is up to us to make peace by willing to step into their lives and step into their circumstances and step into the flames at our own peril because you might be accused of being a bigot. You might be accused of being intolerant. You might be accused of being a religious zealot. You might be accused. Do you hear what I'm saying? But here's the cool thing. The Holy Spirit, if we will listen to Him, 
He will tell us when to keep our mouths shut and when to open it wide. But I got to tell you, we cannot walk into the rest of our lives in this world and in this season and in this stage of history being afraid and being driven by fear and, and just letting the world burn down. God has called us to love and love deeply, and that means it's at the risk of getting hurt. It's at the risk of uh, uh, burn, going down in flames with them. It's at the risk of losing it all. It's at the risk of losing our reputation. It's at the risk of somebody not liking us anymore. It's at the risk of somebody uh, uh, doing mean things to us because you're the bigot, you're, you're the religious zealot, and we hate you now. Do you hear what I'm saying? But if we do it in love... In love. All of these stories that, the only stories that get printed are the ones that are uh, uh, of the mean people, right? So you're not going to get on the front page of the Washington Post, oh, look, there's the nice Christian. No. They're not going to do that. They only want the nasty story of the people who don't act like they're Christians. Do you hear what I'm saying? Blessed are the peacemakers, the doers. Okay, i got to keep moving on. I'm just through my introduction. What time is it? Oh, my goodness. Not doing good today. Uh, <laughs> when you experience the shalom of God, you experience peace in your hearts. So first of all, we experience peace with God. Peace with God. Peace with God. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have what? Peace with God. We have shalom with God. Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. I like the wording of this, of undeserved privilege. You don't deserve the privilege of the peace of God, but yet He has given it to you and to I. Where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's the first place that you can rest your heart in is the peace of God, knowing that He loves you unconditionally and He has given you undeserved privilege to walk in His strength and His power. Amen? And because of that, we experience peace within ourselves. Philippians 4, 6. This is so, so needed today. Do not be anxious. I got to tell you, I need this verse. Anybody here need this verse? Oh my goodness, do not be anxious for anything. But in every situation, not in some situations, not in the light situations, not in the meaningless situation, in every situation, whether it seems little or seems big, whether it seems ugly, whether it seems minute, I don't care, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then, so I see a pattern here of living. Do you? It's not magic with me. I am no brain surgeon. I'm no, uh, no, no, no great theologian here. It's just like it's right there in front of us. Prayer. Petition, thanksgiving, if we will go to God on a daily, consistent basis, sometimes multiple times a day, I don't care how many times it takes. How many of you take Tylenol? Ever? Go ahead, it's nothing to be ashamed of. No sin in taking Tylenol. Ibuprofen, what's your favorite? Excedrin with caffeine? Ha! <laughs> When you've got that pounding headache, how many times a day do you take it? 
I'll give you a little clue. I don't read the Bible. I take it throughout the day until it's gone. As many times as it takes. As many times as it takes. Say it with me. As many times as it takes. Now, I'm not here to push Tylenol on you. and <laughs> I'm not a drug dealer. But I am here to tell you, when it comes to prayer and petitioning God and bringing thanksgiving to God as many times as it takes, if you need peace, and you haven't gotten your peace yet. You're not living in that shalom yet. You're not living in that contentment yet. You don't have that wholeness, that completeness, that fulfillment, that inner rest yet. What do you do? Prayer, petition, thanksgiving, as many times as it takes. And then, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding... I, it doesn't matter if I didn't get to the rest of the sermon. If we, we could stop right here with this one. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You don't understand how you're making it. You don't understand how you're upright today. You don't understand how you got out of bed today. You didn't need Tylenol today. You didn't need, because prayer, petition, thanksgiving, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, as many times as it takes. And that means even when you don't feel like it. Well, I just didn't feel like praying today. I just didn't feel like reading my Bible today. I just didn't feel like being thankful today. So? Seriously, so what? Who cares what you feel like? Did you feel like taking a Tylenol when you had a headache? No. You didn't want to get up out of bed. You didn't want to get up from that recliner. That recliner feels so good, but your head is hurting so bad it drove you to the medicine cabinet to go get that Tylenol, that Advil, that whatever anyway. You ached every step of the way to it, but yet you got up and you got it anyway because you knew it was going to do something. But I got to tell you, I don't care if you feel like it or not. Prayer, petition, thanksgiving, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, prayer, petition, thanksgiving. Living in the presence of God will change your life. It will change your life. And it will bring you peace, that shalom, that contentment, that inner rest that transcends all understanding. And it will then it guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It guards your heart because your heart and your mind are constant targets of the enemy. They're constant targets of the, That's where he gets you is in your mind. The battleground is in your mind. Of all the parts of your body, of all the parts of your being, the most powerful part that the devil tries to get in is your mind. Because if he can defeat you in your mind, he's got you everywhere else. But the way you guard your mind, the way you guard your heart, is to be in prayer and petition and thanksgiving and let his word sink into your heart. When a problem causes you to lose your peace. This is a quote from an old dead guy. I don't remember his name, so I didn't write it down. It's good to quote old dead guys because they can't mess up anymore, right? Sometimes you quote living people and then they go off and they mess up and you're like, oop, I can't quote him anymore, <laughs> right? Don't name a building after somebody that's still alive, wait till they're dead and they got a good testimony and they went to heaven. Like, then you can name a building after them <laughs> or else you might have to take the plaque down. When a problem causes you to lose your peace, don't hurry to resolve the problem in hopes of regaining peace. You see the pattern here. Most of us, we want to fix the problem so we get our peace back. But first, regain your peace and then see what can be done to solve the problem. It's a reverse order thing. Get peace in your heart first because you know what? Usually, uh, maybe you're just better and smarter than me, but when I don't have peace, I make bad choices. I make bad decisions and I make the 
situation worse usually. So the, the pattern here should be I get my peace back first and then I solve my problem. And then we experience, so we've, we're experiencing peace with God, peace in ourselves, and then peace with our circumstances. John 16, I have told you these things, Jesus says to us, to his disciples, so that in me, in Jesus, you might have what? Peace. peace. Not just peace as in nothing going wrong, but shalom peace, like even if everything's going wrong, you have shalom, contentment. You have peace. Then he goes on. Isn't this encouraging? He says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> How can you be talking about going on and having trouble when he's talking about peace? I'm going to bring you peace, but you're going to have trouble. That doesn't make sense, does it? But, oh, yes, it does make complete sense. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I, not I, Keith, I, Jesus, Jesus has overcome the world. That's where your peace lies. So we extend peace through our lives. That's our job, is to extend peace through our lives, to make peace in the world that we're living in. And the way we do that is we stay focused on the real issue. I'm going to wrap this up real quickly. John 10.10, 10, here's the key. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. My, my foundational verse of life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So the real issue is that there's an enemy outside of yourself. There's an, an enemy outside of your marriage, outside of your relationships, outside of your job. Your problem is not your boss. Your problem is not your wife or your husband. Your problem is not, it, although it might be manifesting itself that way, but the problem is the enemy of your soul. The devil, devil and demons are real, and he wants to destroy. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the real issue. And so the way we solve that is, first of all, we see others through God's eyes. Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind, man and woman, every person, in the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Another sermon for another time. We spread peace by living in peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, be, I like the word be, that's a powerful word, powerful two little word, be the peace you want to see in the world. Be the peace you want to see in the world. You know what? There will not ever be world peace. There might be false, a false sense of peace when the Antichrist comes for a short time, but there will never be true peace in the world because there's always sin in the world. There's always evil in the world. There will never be peace. There will always be wars and rumors of wars and always evil in the world. But yet, in our world, we get the opportunity to display the peace of God. James 3.18, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. And reap a harvest of righteousness. So number three, and this lastly, I'm closing, if our musicians will come. John 17, 22. Sell so the Message Bible. I love the Message Bible. I can't read it every day because it just takes me too long. <laughs> but I love it for emphasis. The same glory you gave me, Jesus is speaking, I gave them. He's saying the same glory that he has, he's giving to you. So they'll be as unified and together as we are, I in them and you in me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and loved them in the same way that you've loved me. We will never... Be more like God than we 
are when we take the wholeness and the completeness we have, the shalom we have, into a world that desperately needs it. Blessed are the peace makers. I want to ask you today, is there some place in your life and is there some place in your relationships, is there some place in your world that you need to make peace? Peace.